Everyone, welcome to our service here at Holiday Bible Church. We're glad that you chose to be here with us to worship the Lord. Uh, a few announcements before we get going today. This is kind of a special day for us and, and some other people as well. As we have some baptisms that are going to take place today after our service. So that's a great thing. That's awesome. Excited for that. Excited for those people. Uh, pray that it would be a blessing to all of us. Um, one other thing that we've mentioned a couple of times is the church work day. Um, I believe that's what that, the 11th? Okay, there we go. Church work day on the 11th of November. It's about two weeks out or so. If you can be here, that would be great. We've got a few things that we could use a hand with to keep the building in, um, keep, it, keep it as nice as we can keep it with the hands that we have. And then another announcement here, a new members class. We're going to start one of those Saturday, November 18th. Is that right? Saturday, November 18th, new members class. So if you are interested in becoming a member here, um, please come up, see myself, see Bo. Uh, Bo's going to have most of the information on that. He's going to be the one who's going to teach that class. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to join us and be a member, come up and see us. Same thing for baptism, too, if you're interested in that. Uh, you've not done it before, you want more information on that, come up, see myself, see Bo again. We'd love to talk to you about it. Last announcement is our Thanksgiving praise service and breakfast. All right? That is November 19th here at the church. Uh, if you're able to and want to, bring some food. We usually do a, like kind of like a potluck style thing. Um, and then we give a time for all of you to Praise God for something that's on your heart, maybe something he's done this year for you, whatever it might be. Um, so be thinking about that. We'd love to have you with us. We'd love to, to just worship with you what God has done in your life. Now, that's all the announcements. Feels like a million of them, but even it's only four. Let's turn our attention to worship now. Psalm 118, verse 24. This psalm tells us, this is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day, right? You get one day at a time. We don't get two days. We don't get three days. We get one day. So let's praise God this day, his day, the Lord's day together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love that you first loved us. We thank you that you sent Jesus to this earth to pay for my sins, to pay for the sins of those who would simply turn to him and accept. God, we thank you for that. We pray that today you would attune our hearts to your word, help us to really just dig into the word and what it means for our own lives. Perhaps we've never turned our life over to you. Maybe that would today would be the day that somebody seriously thinks about that and maybe acts on that and actually does it. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would, please stand with us to sing the almighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and 
that a wonderful comfort to know that anywhere you go, God is with you. He's right there. When you accept Christ as your Savior, he implants his Holy Spirit inside you, and there's nowhere you can go that he is not there with you. Whatever trial, whatever trouble, whatever thing you're going through, let's sing of the amazing grace. expansion on uh, at least one, maybe two of the announcements. Um, we are celebrating uh, the baptism 
of six individuals this morning. And so uh, just by way of uh, understanding the structure of how things are going to function, um, as you came in, you probably saw the wonderful brand new horse trough uh, out front. Uh, yes, that is where we're going to baptize, all right? So uh, immediately following the morning service, we are going to have about a 10-minute transition time um, just to get everyone out there. Uh, if you think you might need a chair, um, we can grab those and, and let those who are being baptized have an opportunity to change. But we will transition out there uh, for that time of um, rejoicing and celebrating the baptism of some of God's people. Um, and then immediately following the baptism, uh, we, we're going to enjoy lunch together. So this is where sometimes there is a blend between announcement and worship, right? Because uh, more often than not, we desire that what we are announcing is actual opportunity to participate in fellowship with God and with his people. And so, um, and part of the way we do that is through obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has given us as the church two rites in which we follow him in obedience and in which we demonstrate his gospel in a visible way. And we just so happen to have the opportunity to uh, show our obedience in both of those this morning. Baptism is coming a little later, but right now we have the opportunity to follow him in obedience and participating around the Lord's table. And so let me read for us what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 27, he says, Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let me give a word of explanation. It's two applications to Paul's words here in verses 27 through 29. One is that if you are here this morning and you are part of God's family, you have responded to the offer of grace through faith in Christ, repenting of your sins, and this table is open for you. But God does call us to examine our hearts, to make sure we are not holding on to some uh, area or some sin, some closeted item in our heart that we are unrepentant of. That is an area in which we are walking unworthily of His grace. The second thing this would mean is that if you have not come to faith in Christ, then understand, uh, while we love you, this is really a family table. And for your benefit, uh, for your good, I would encourage you to watch and to wonder at what is taking place, but not to participate. And, and don't worry, because no one's watching, right? No one's going to take count of who's participating and who isn't. But that's the warnings that I would ask us to heed. Now, a little instruction on how we function here. In the back, there is a table, and there are two golden trays on each of them. They're not really gold, okay? They're golden in color. On that back, I don't want us to sound like we're all hoity-toity, right? But, they're, uh, but in those trays are, are stacks of cups that contain the, the juice and uh, the bread item that we're going to participate in. So... I'm going to give us an opportunity to pray together, to examine our hearts together, to fix our attention on the crucified Christ who has been risen again for our redemption. And then I'm going to lead us in a prayer of repentance together. And then once we are done that prayer, the music is going to play. And, and the opportunity is going to be for you to join with us in singing. And as we sing... The invitation is open for you to head to the back and grab one of those cups. If getting back there is an issue, if getting in and out of the seat is an issue, slip a hand up. We will have someone watching who can bring that to you. Um, and then we're all going to come back together and participate in those elements um, as part of God's people. But let's take a moment and let's reflect on the Lord. Let's examine our hearts together.
we who are your people come this morning in the confidence that we have been washed by the blood of your Son. But having been so cleansed, we also recognize that it is easy for us to dirty our hands and our feet. Oftentimes far easier than we would like to admit. We give in to temptation. We give in to illicit desire. We harbor wrong thoughts and bad feelings. And so God, part of what we do this morning is to open our hearts and ask you to examine, to see us. And to see if there is any wicked way in us. So God, we humble ourselves before the cross of Christ. And we ask that you might cleanse us. We ask that you might renew us. And we ask that we might with joy participate in this visible reminder of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. So God, we pray that you might receive honor as we, your people, your family, sit together around your table and celebrate your activity, your sacrifice in bringing us home. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 118 says this, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Let's sing together.
will see your face bright as the sun will bow again in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray and just thank God for his goodness. Before we sing our last song, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Father, we just partook in something that is meant to really make us feel incorporated into your family as believers and also to remind us of the fact that you haven't left us to go to heaven, to sit on a throne and just sit there. You're coming again. You're with us now, Lord. We thank you so much for the fact that through your blood, through Jesus' blood, our sins are not held against us, that we can live a free life, free of fear that you're going to crush us for our next mistake because of what Jesus did. Father, uh, it would be my heart's desire that anyone who didn't know what it was like to be a part of your family, that they would want to be a part of your family. Pray for us here who are in your family. Give us strength, Lord, to honor you appropriately through our words and deeds. We pray that our singing today would be a sweet thing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Savior leads me 
That's really all our hope, isn't it? That it is the sovereign, good, and wise king of the universe who leads us through the trials of life. We're going to read together once more the book of Jude. You've been with us, you know we are working our way through this brief little letter. And because it's so brief, we're just reading the whole thing every time. All right, so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Jude 1, um, and we're going to read through verse 25. And if you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along up here on the screen as I read. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have 
crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, both now and forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we ask once more that you would draw near to us through your words. We ask that you would do in our hearts what only you can accomplish. We ask that your grace and your mercy might be evident. Teach us, even as you change us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We said last week that Jude, what he is doing in this short little letter is giving us what what we termed as a portrait of an imposter. If you recall, if you were with us, or even as we just read it, Jude has called the church, kind of the action item of this letter is to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, the 
unchanging truth of the Gospel is under fire. And so we need to be ready to engage in the battle. We need to be ready to contend for that Gospel truth. But that's not surprising to us. The world has never been a friend to the Gospel. It's either going to try to suppress the truth by force or often more subtly by adopting the language of the truth without actually submitting themselves to it. In other words, they use the truth in order to get what they want, and in doing so, they subvert the truth. I mean, historically, in our own country, we've been very comfortable with the language of the truth. But that truth has often been used to serve what is the real God of our society. The God of stuff. The God of money. The God of a growing economy. I'll never forget, uh, even as a fairly young kid, the words of a presidential candidate who said, it's the economy, stupid. And you know what? He was very, very right. The truth for us has long been a means to a different end than the Lord intended. God intended His grace to lead us to salvation. Ultimately, to be like His own Son. Perfect. Redeemed. Holy. But there are those who take that grace and twist it to use it for their own purposes. But we're not surprised by the fact that that's what the world does. They are the world, in fact, right? They're, they're not of us. We are not of them, though we are among them. What surprises us, then, is what Job says, or where uh, he says, Jude, I said Job, where Jude says the threat actually comes from because he says in verse number four, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. In other words, the threat to the church is already inside the house. There are imposters on the inside. They look the part. They sound the part. They often act the part. And so it is imperative that we understand the nature of the threat. That we learn how to identify who the imposters really are. And then it is also important that we learn how to respond to the imposter. Which isn't coming for a couple more weeks yet. But is equally important. Because sometimes when you find an imposter, when you find you've been fooled by an imposter, How do we respond? Generally not too kindly. It could be a severe punishment. But according to Jude, in the church, when we find an imposter, what do we do? We display mercy. Even while trying to snatch them from the danger that they do not even realize they're in. So last week we saw, as we started to unravel or unmask the imposter, Jude says that these people do not heed the lessons of the past. They follow their own private truth. They're dreamers. They defile the flesh. They're not afraid to sin. They reject authority, which means no one can judge them or call them sinners. And they blaspheme holy ones. They have no respect for spiritual powers. And, they, and so what they cannot understand on a spiritual level that they have no respect, they don't honor it, they don't submit to it, they blaspheme it. And finally, they live according to their own instincts. Rather than submitting to the authority and wisdom of God's Word, they're controlled by their own desires. Today, we're going to look at verses 11 through 13, and we're going to catch two more characteristics of those who pose a threat from the inside. And here they are, I'm going to give them to you up front. The first characteristic is the imposters lead others into trouble. They don't go down alone. They do not suffer 
alone. They bring others with them into their sin. Number two, they are often disguised, but they are always dangerous. They are often disguised, but they are always dangerous. Let's look at the first one. Verse number 11 of Jude says, Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and they perished in Korah's rebellion. Jude goes back to the Old Testament again to give us three comparisons to these modern day imposters Cain, Balaam, and Korah. So, what's the connection? Let's take them one at a time. Cain, we, we know this story, right? From way back in Genesis chapter 4, Cain was the one, if you recall, he was the eldest son of Adam and Eve. And one day, because God uh, rejected the sacrifice that. Uh, the offerings that Cain was bringing and accepted the offerings and sacrifices of his younger brother Abel, Cain, in a fit of jealous rage, killed his younger brother. God shows up and confronts him and says, Cain, where's your brother? And Cain very nonchalantly and non-repentantly says, am I my brother's keeper? By the way, in case you're wondering, the answer to that question is always yes. Inside the church family, the answer is always yes. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. But Cain says, what, what, it's my responsibility to keep up with my little brother, right? He's old enough, he should take care of himself. And God says, his blood cries to me from the ground. I know what you did. And rather than repent, we are told in verse number 16 of Genesis 4 that Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, which Nod literally means wandering. He settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now, if you were with us a number of years ago, uh, when we started our study in the book of Exodus, uh, you'll recall that the movement east in the book of Genesis is always a picture of people moving away from fellowship with and nearness with God. That's why the entrance to the tabernacle and the temple was always facing west. It was to receive the people coming back out of the east. But here Cain moves further east. He's wandering. He's away from the presence of God. He becomes then kind of the archetypal sinner. He's the, he's the pattern that all who follow him will follow after. He's the first to largely abandon all of the ways of God. In his rebellion then, was not without affecting other people. As a matter of fact, in Jewish antiquity, in ancient Jewish writings, Cain is often referred to as someone who led other people into sin. Josephus, uh, the first century Jewish historian, says this of Cain. He, Cain, incited to luxury and pillage, or stealing, thievery, all who he met and became their instructor in wicked practices. We said, well, where is this in the Bible? Can, is this a legitimate inference about who Cain was from the Bible? Let me give you one thing, and, and this is, this is going to just crack the door on a bigger discussion, but we're going to crack it and leave it there, okay? Genesis chapter 4, verse 17 says, Cain knew his wife, and they had a son, and they named the son Enoch, and then it says, and Cain built a city and named it after his son Enoch. You say, what's the big deal about that? You remember back in Genesis chapter 1 when God created man? Where did he put man? He put him in a garden, right? Not a city. Cain leaves the garden, moves east, and builds a city. What is a city? Well, the ancient term for city is the term ear. It literally means just a walled, enclosed area. And so what Cain does is he fears for his life. He leaves the protection in the nearness of God. And instead he builds protection for himself. He becomes a city dweller. I always knew there was something wrong with people who wanted to live in a city, right? Now, now hang on, right? Because, uh, because by the end of time, what is it that comes down to earth? The presence of God comes down as a city. Walled. But the walls are now gemstones and the gates are always open, right? God takes our history as people and He redeems it, right? The city will remain, 
But in this context, I think it's a picture of the fact that Cain was abandoning the plan of God, abandoning the protection of God, and going his own way. By the way, let me give you one other, one other inference here that I, that I think we can make. You remember when God puts Adam to sleep and he takes a rib and he, he builds a woman, right? It's almost the exact same phrase as Enoch built a city, right? And it's, almost, it's a parallel phrase. And the word for city is ear. Guess what the word for woman is? As ear. As ear. Or not woman, I'm sorry, but the word for helper. He made Adam a helper that was fitting for him. Ear as ear. God had made a plan for the protection of man, for the protection of humanity. And you know what it was? Relationship and brotherhood. Marriage that would lead one another into Christ-likeness. But we abandoned the ways of God. And we walled ourselves off. And we went our own way. Now, like I said, we're cracking the door, right? That opens like a bazillion questions. And we don't even have the Discovering God Hour today, so you can't even ask any questions. I'm sorry. you got to save them for next week. Come back, and I promise in the second hour, ask me all kinds of questions about the city. And uh, we'll have a, a good old time tracing that through the Scripture. Um, if you wonder, though, like how did this turn out for Cain? Well, initially, God blesses the city in spite of the fact that this was not God's plan or his desire. He blesses the city and the people in it, like the, the close uh, uh, relationship, the, the, the closeness of, of these image bearers begins to produce and, and they create instruments and music, like there's technological advancement. But then we get this. There's a, a descendant of Cain whose name is Lamech. And Lamech says, listen to what I say. Lamech, by the way, has two wives, which is automatically an indication he is further down the road of rebellion against God. He says, listen to what I say, my two wives. I have killed a man. Right? He's right, following in the way of Cain. I've killed a man for wounding me. That word is like, he slapped me, and I killed him. He struck me, and I struck him down. Right? If Cain's revenge then is sevenfold, then let Lamech's be seventy-sevenfold. And in the very next chapter, we get, man, the wickedness of man just, just multiplied on the earth. These people were following after their father, Cain. He had been their instructor in rebellion. There is a warning here when he calls these people, these imposters in the church, he says they've followed, they're walking in the way of Cain. Walking is just, that's the matter, uh, that's the pattern of their life. They're following the pattern laid down by the sinner. The one who laid the pathway away from God to show us what it was like to totally and completely abandon God. And you know what? It had effect on those around him. You remember when, when God tells to Moses, I am, I am, my name is Yahweh, I am the Lord, right? And I am merciful and I am gracious, but I will visit the iniquity of the Father on the Son to the third and the fourth generation. You know what that means? That means, Father, your sin has an effect on the people closest to you. Mothers, daughters, sons, grandchildren aunts, uncles, our sin has effect on the people around us. But thank God His grace is greater. But those who are imposters always have an effect on other people. Folks, there is here a warning against following those who have abandoned God. You will not escape their judgment if you choose to follow them. The second illustration is from Balaam. Uh, Numbers chapter 22. If you want an interesting story, go read the story of Balaam. There's like talking donkeys and, and all kinds of crazy stuff that go on in that story. But Jude says these people have abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. But just real quickly, Balaam was approached by a man named Balak who was the king of Moab. And Balak offered to richly reward Balaam if he were to come and curse Israel. So Moab was in the land kind of adjacent to the land of promise that God was leading his people into. Israel shows up on his doorstep. They defeat a neighboring country. And all of a sudden, Balak's like, uh-oh, right? I'm not sure I'm real comfortable with his people. We might be next. And so he tries to hire Balaam. And so he sends emissaries to Balaam and say, come and curse these people. And, and the Lord shows up to Balaam and says, do not go with them. And so he sends more people and offers a greater reward. 
And Balaam goes back to God, and God is like, fine, go with them, but you will only say what the words that I give you to say. So three times, Balaam is told by Balak to curse Israel, and three times, Balaam opened his mouth, and out comes a blessing instead of a curse. Now, what was Balaam's error? It says they followed in Balaam's error. Balaam was at, at was not actually able to accomplish anything other than blessing Israel. So what was his error? When Numbers chapter 24 ends, it appears that Balaam and Balak have been completely thwarted. But if you flip the page to Numbers chapter 25, we're told of a story, uh, kind of a, a sad story of Moabite women who approach Israelite men and entice those men to sacrifice to their Moabite gods by, uh, through, through sexual enticements. And the men follow along. And so instead of worshiping the Lord alone, they're now offering uh, uh, to the idols of the Moabites sacrifices and worship. And as a result, God killed 24,000 of them. So what in the world does that have to do with Balaam? Well, we don't find out until Numbers chapter 31 that that was all the master plan of Balaam. God thwarted every attempt he made to curse Israel. And so instead, he gave advice to Balak and said, you know what you should do? You should send your women in to entice the men to worship your God. That'll be their weak spot. And when you do, God himself will curse them. Why would he do such a thing? He was driven by greed. He tried to curse in exchange for riches. That's why Jude finds Balaam's story so appropriate. Of all the stories in the Old Testament that he could have chosen, he chooses this one. Why? Because these people who are infiltrating the church, who are imposters in the church, they are being led oftentimes by their own greed. Religion becomes merely an opportunity for them to fill their own bank accounts. And they will say whatever and do whatever is required to get what they want. But makes, folks, make no mistake. Those who follow in the pattern of these imposters who are led by greed will not escape their judgment. Just like the Israelites. Just like the Moabites, by the way. Who in Deuteronomy chapter 23, the Lord says, No Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with bread and water on the way. Instead, they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Balaam's advice led to the downfall of many, both inside Israel and outside. Beware of those driven by greed and sexual desire. The third illustration he gives is Korah. Korah was an Israelite. We, we come across him in number 16. Korah and, and his group of followers confronted Moses. They were opposing his authority, claiming that all the congregation were holy and that they all uh, had the presence of the Lord among them. And so, who are you, Moses? Right? Like, we should be able to get into the presence of God. We should be able to prophesy. We should be able to lead. Who do you think you are? And God opened the earth and He swallowed them up. They were sent directly to that place called Sheol in the Hebrew language. That place that is often used to portray future, final, ultimate judgment from God. Folks, beware of those who reject authority. You will not escape their judgment if you choose to follow them. Each of these individuals were guilty of sin themselves, but they were also guilty of leading other people into sin. That's what imposters do. That's what rebels against the law of God do. They're not content to rebel on their own. They want to gather with them others who will follow. And so it's no wonder then that, Joel, that, that uh, Jude pronounces on them at the beginning of the section a woe. Woe to them. Well, that's a strange word for us. We think of woe like when I'm riding a horse, like, whoa, Nelly, right? But woe in, in, into the Hebrews was a prophetic 
pronouncement of judgment against God's enemies. And we find this all over the place in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 23, he says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep. God says, You've scattered my flock. Therefore, I will drive you away. I will attend to you for your evil deeds. Woe to you. Jesus pronounces seven woes in Matthew chapter 23 against the scribes and the Pharisees. And so, in a sense, Jude here has taken up the prophetic mantle to pronounce judgment on all those who have abandoned God. And the warning to us is clear do not follow those who have turned the grace of God into license for sin. Do not follow the imposter. You will not escape their judgment if you do. Jude then launches into a series of metaphors to further describe these people. And this is one of the few times that Jude abandons his love of threes, but not entirely. Like, like a lot of things, as Jude mentions, it, it's like, there are three things, right? This time, he doesn't give us three, he doubles it. He gives us six. Then he gives us all of these pictures, all of these images that are meant to help us understand who these imposters are and what they are like. And so he says in Jude chapter 12, or chapter 12, verse 12, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. It's image number one. Number two, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. And finally, number six, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for other, for, forever. What, what is the one thing that all these things have in common? Here's what I would say. And this is point number two. What is a characteristic of these imposters? Point number two is this. Imposters are often disguised, but they are always dangerous. They're always dangerous. I don't know if you realize, but Halloween's coming up. Tuesday night. Our neighborhoods are going to be filled with kids, and, and let's be real honest, some adults too, right? It's people that we might look at and go, you're probably a little too old to be asking me for candy. There are going to be in all kinds of different costumes, ranging from funny to scary, but by and large, those in costume, those little kids running around dressed like, you know, ghosts, they're harmless, right? As long as you give them some candy, they're harmless. No matter how realistic the costume, the individual behind the mask is likely not really a witch with the ability to whip up a potion from her cauldron and turn you into a toad, right? They're an imposter, they're in disguise, but they're relatively harmless. And let's be honest, oftentimes cute. But these people who are imposters in the church with their disguises, they are not harmless. They're in some ways the opposite of the kids who are going to be on our streets on Tuesday night. Rather than harmless kids dressed as scary ghosts, these are scary wolves dressed as harmless sheep. That's how you get inside, by the way. Right? You have to look the part. If you show up and look like a wolf and act like a wolf and sound like a wolf, it's pretty easy for the church to go, uh, 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 right? Nah, I don't think so. Not up in here, Satan, right? But if you show up and you look like a sheep and you kind of you kind of change your voice to sound like a sheep and you do sheep things, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> then it's a whole lot more difficult to discern, right? Because you look so harmless and and some of them, you get up and you lead us in music and you take care of our kids in the back and you teach us and, and we, we get along well. We vote the same way. And, and so we just kind of welcome you in because we have so much in common. You look so much like we do and sometimes we don't ever bother to get to the heart of knowing anybody beyond what they're showing us on the exterior. And folks, if that's what we do in church, then we are susceptible to imposters. If we are content with surface level relationships with one another, hey, how's it going? Good. Fantastic. Sit down and sing. Let's get out of here. All right? 
I'll see you again next Sunday for about two and a half minutes. If that's the pattern, then we are susceptible to imposters. They're disguised and they're dangerous. Let's work through these images real quickly. The first thing he says is they are hidden reefs. Now this one is this one is probably the most difficult because that word reefs can literally be translated two different ways. It could be that he's talking about kind of a, a rocky outcropping out in the water that lies just below the surface. And so you kind of get the image that if you're in a boat and you're skimming along on the surface of the water and, and there's a, a, a hidden reef underneath, then you can run aground on that reef. It can have a, a destructive, dangerous encounter with your boat. But it's kind of hidden. And if you're not paying attention to the ripples on the water, you might run into that reef. But this could also mean spots. These are spots at your love feast. In other words, uh, there are a presence that soils. They, they dirty whatever comes near. They are themselves an infection in your love feast. In other words, what is meant to be feasts characterized by love are blemished by the presence of those who do not fear social sanction. They do not fear church discipline of any kind. They're a danger to the spiritual well-being of those present. Folks, we're sharing a meal together today. We've already participated in one. We have another still to come. And in many ways, these are our love feasts as a church. Can I ask the question, what kind of presence will you be? The kind that promotes the love of God or the kind that stains it? Which might lead us to a really important question. How do we promote the love of God rather than stain it? Let me give you three thoughts. Number one, reach out. Reach out. Maybe don't sit with your normal crew. Make it a point to get to know someone a little better. Number two, go deeper. Go deeper. See if you can get beyond the normal pleasantries and talk of football and really find out where people are. And number three, don't stop. Don't let this be the only time you connect in this way. If we are to be a church characterized by love, then we must pursue one another because that's really what the nature of love is, isn't it? The, the nature of love is pursuit. I pursue by nature that which I love. The problem is that we often wait on our feelings to decide for us whether or if we should pursue. But listen to me, don't wait on your feelings. Love is not a feeling first. It is first a commitment. And then a feeling. Folks, if you want to display the love of God, if you want to promote it in our church, then pursue love for one another. Don't wait till you feel it. Do it. They are spots. They are hidden reefs. Number two, they are shepherds feeding themselves. Here we can go back to Ezekiel 34. God says to his prophet, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not the shepherds feed the sheep? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. Folks, here's the thing. Instead of loving other people, instead of feeding other people, these imposters take advantage of other people. Right? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The imposters use the sheep for their own gain, even if it means hurt for the sheep. They have no love for the church. What they really love is themselves, and they will pursue that love, even if it means stepping over or stepping on others in the process. That's what Jeremiah or Ezekiel was accusing the shepherds of the religious leaders, those religious leaders of Israel, that's what he was accusing them of doing. They were feeding themselves and not the sheep. They were stepping right over the sheep. 
to get to the feeding trough first. Stepping right past them, ignoring those needs to stuff their own bellies. But they were also feeding on the sheep. Did you catch that part? Like my sheep are in their mouths. I've got to rescue my sheep right out of the mouth of these wolves, these shepherds. Because not only are they willing to step over people, they're willing to step on people to get what they want. One, one of these, stepping over other people, is a settled indifference to others. They just don't care. While the other goes beyond indifference to harm. I will take what is mine regardless of what it does to you. And folks, neither are acceptable. Do not allow yourself to grow into a settled indifference to the people who share this room with you on Sundays. Don't do it. That's going to be the temptation. Week in and week out, there is going to be the temptation to grow into a settled indifference toward one another. Don't allow it. Be aware of it and don't allow it. Do not allow yourself to grow indifferent to those who have signed the church covenant with you. Folks, this is the way of the imposter. Number three, they are waterless clouds. Proverbs 25, 14 says, Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they're imposters. The clouds look good, but there's actually nothing there, right? And we had the experience a, a lot, it seems like, this summer where clouds would pop up in the distance and it's like, oh, finally some rain, and then it would just like nothing, right? There were clouds, but nothing ever came. There was never any help. There was never any benefit to us from, the, from the, the clouds. And so our grass just burned up, and we looked at it and watched it die because I'm not paying for the water, right? There's no amens on that one. Oh, you almost live in those kind of HOA places. Folks here, again, are people who look the part, but they bring nothing of genuine value to the party. They can't be trusted. They're useless. They cannot satisfy. And this makes them dangerous because those who believe and follow after them will be drawn away from the one source of life and made to eat that which cannot satisfy, which is going to lead to malnourishment of the soul. Your soul will atrophy. Your faith will shrink, leaving you in danger of spiritual shipwreck. These people have nothing to provide on a spiritual level. Rather than give and pour in and water, they will take. They're just, like the, they're just like the false gods of Psalm 115 we saw a few weeks ago. That the psalmist says they are completely worthless. They are completely useless as God. And as we learn in Psalm 115, those who make those kinds of God and worship those kinds of gods become like those kinds of gods. Empty. Devoid of purpose. Since they're driven by the wind, this might be a reference to their false doctrine. Ephesians 4 says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. It's yet another reminder that behind the facade, these people have abandoned the faith once handed down to the saints. They look the part, but underneath they are functioning according to a completely different value system. They're driven with the wind. Whatever way the wind blows. He says they are twice dead trees. They're fruitless. Though they are trees in autumn, which is the time of harvest, they have no fruit to give. They are, for all intents and purposes, dead. It looks like a tree that is alive, but the evidence of death is there. It can produce no fruit. And then it says they are Uprooted. By the way, that, that kind of reminds us of the image of Jesus. When he, remember when he's going into Jerusalem and he comes to the fig tree and he goes up to the fig tree looking for fruit and there's nothing there? It, it's dead and so he curses it and it actually dies. It was of no value. It was of no use. And that was an illustration to him of the, the facade of the temple and the Israelite worship system. It was empty. It looked the part. But there was nothing real and genuine going on inside. There was no spiritual fruit. Their faith is dead, to put it as James 2 puts it. They were imposter branches, like Jesus warns about in John 15. They looked like a branch, but they're not actually connected to the vine. And then he says they're uprooted. 
they're blown over by the wind. In other words, they're destroyed by the very false doctrine that they're trying to embrace. It just blows them over. Fifthly, we get wild waves of the sea casting up foam. The image here is that of being totally uncontrollable. They're driven by wind. Whatever is popular, whatever is new, whatever believes, whatever belief seems the easiest. And today, it's way easier to accept the world's sexual ethic than it is to remain faithful to the Scripture, isn't it? For these people, for the imposter, the clear teaching and warning of Scripture is not enough to rein them in. They're wild. They do as they please. They have cast off the law of God. Which doesn't mean genuine freedom, by the way. We think that means freedom, but what it means is now you are slave to the wind. Whatever way the wind blows, that is where you will go. That is where you will drift. It says they cast up their own foam. You know what that means? I mean, we live near beaches here. We know what that is. Sometimes you go out on the beach and it's like, that is too much foam. Or like, I ain't even getting in that. All right? What this means is that they are shameless. They don't even try to hide it. The foam of their rebellion. The foam of their evil. They have no problem displaying their shameful behavior or their shameful beliefs to anyone who will look. Now listen, let's be honest for a second. That doesn't sound too bad in a society that glorifies individuality the way that we do, right? We are all about the individuality of a person. So you do you, and no one has the right to tell you that you should do otherwise. And when we promote that, we essentially give people the freedom to display their anti-God, anti-lawness for all the world to see, and we elevate them for it. So we have a hard time understanding why this would have been such an issue. But if you put yourself in a society, in a culture, like was the case in ancient Israel, and like is still the case in many Eastern societies today, it, it, those are considered honor-shame cultures. In, in other words, your honor, what you do, how you live, the choices you make, it, it, it's not about you, it's about the people around you. It's about your community. It's about not doing anything to bring disgrace or dishonor on the family or on the clan or on the society. Aristotle, you remember that guy? Old philosopher, Greek philosopher? He said, let shame be defined this way. Shame is a kind of pain or uneasiness in respect to misdeeds, right? I do something wrong, I feel shame for it. I get uneasy, I don't feel okay. And that tends to bring dishonor, he said. And let's define shamelessness, he says, as contempt and indifference in regard to these same things. So in other words, a shameless person is one who is not worried about honor or dishonor. I'm only worried about me and my individuality. Folks, these people are not able to be controlled by fear or shame or dishonor or discipline or law. They wear their sin as a badge of honor, as a signet of grace. They have taken the grace of God and they have perverted it as a means to their own ends. And they are exalted for it. They're glorified for it. Lastly, he says they are wandering stars. From uh, this, is, this is super interesting. Wandering, um, here is the word uh, planetai. Planetai. What does that sound like in English? Planet, right? So, so planetai stars. They're wandering stars. This was the way that those, and man, the Greeks were super smart people, right? Like they were watching the sky, the Romans, they were watching the sky and they realized that there were certain bright lights, certain stars that didn't stay put in the sky. They, they tracked every night. They were in a different place. They're wandering stars. You know what they were looking at? Planets. Planets. Right? You ever go out at night? And, and look up in the sky and you see a, a, a singular, uh, bright, steady light. It's not flickering. You know what you're looking at? You're probably looking at Venus, right? It's super bright. It doesn't flicker. You're looking at a planet. 
But if you go out the next night, it, you know, let's say the moon is here, and night number one, Venus is here, and the next night, Venus is over here, and over here, and over here, right? Planets are, are, are orbiting the sun, and so they don't stay in the same place of our sky. They are wandering stars. And what happens if you are navigating and you set your course according to a wandering star, you are gradually, over time, going to be led off course. It's not like the North Star. It's always in a different place. You cannot set your compass by it. That's what these people are like. By the way, the root word of planetai is, is plane, which means error. It is a wandering from the truth. These are lights. They look the part, but they're just wandering all over the place. They're not fixed to the truth. They've been deceived by error, and those who follow them will be like them. Be careful, folks, who you listen to. Now listen, we, listen we, we live in an information age. You can you could literally pull up pastors and listen to sermons every day from now to the rest of your life and never run out of videos to watch. And on the one hand, I would encourage you, there are many, many, many guys out there who will really encourage your faith. But at the same time, there are many more imposters that will gradually over time lead you away from the faith once delivered to the saints. Don't give in. Be alert. Because he closes with this, this section at least, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. In other words, the same judgment that was given to the angels back in verse number 6 is now being held in reserve. It's being kept. There's our word again, right? said in the beginning, we are kept for Christ. The angels were kept for judgment. And now this nether world is being kept as a judgment for these imposters. Don't follow them. Let's conclude this way. We're beginning to identify these imposters. The question then that comes up is what do we do about it? How do we protect ourselves from being lured away by imposters and, and pursue genuine love for one another? I want to give you a couple of bolos. I used to work at the sheriff's department, right? What, do you know what a bolo is? Be on the lookout. I would get those emails every morning, right? Be on the lookout. Let me give you a few things to be on the lookout for. And this is going to come from a positive perspective, right? We've been looking at the negative. Here are the imposters, the negative. Let's look at it from the positive perspective. Be on the lookout for those who are caught up in sin and rebellion. Show them mercy. Galatians 6 says, restore them in a spirit of meekness yourself. Be on the lookout, number two, for those who are straggling, those who are falling behind. Haven't seen someone in a couple weeks? Reach out. You don't have to be confrontational. Hey, where were you? fishing again. You don't have to be confrontational. Just say mischief. Wanted to get caught up. How are you? Number three, be on the lookout for those who seem to be disengaged. They're here, but not really here. You know what I mean? They're not really engaging with anyone. They're likely vulnerable. They're, they're, they're outside the protective influence of the pack, of the family. Look for those who are disengaged. Number four, be on the lookout for those with strange or new explanations of Scripture. Folks, listen to me. The Bible has been around for a very, very long time. It is highly unlikely as a matter of fact, I will step out on a limb right now this morning and say it's not going to happen. We are not going to discover anything that is going to affect any meaning of any text that is going to change any significant doctrine. It's not going to happen. Beware of the new, the novel. Number five, be on the lookout for those who are themselves new. Invite them in. Sit with them. Make it awkward and take them to lunch. Get to know them. 
Find out if they know Christ. Make the gospel the center of your relationship with them. Number six, be on the lookout for those who have not yet been converted. Because the reality is, folks, you may come as you are, but Jesus will not allow you to remain as you are. Be about the gospel in your relationships. And finally, be on the lookout for disguises that you might be wearing or you might be tempted to put on. Ask the Lord to search you and to know you and to see if there is any wicked way in you. Be as serious about uncovering sin and deception in your own life as you are about uncovering it in others. Folks, be on the lookout because as we grow, all of these things have to do with how we love one another. And the reality is the closer we are, the greater our love for one another, the more protection is there. The less vulnerable we become. Imposters are here. Don't be fooled. Don't follow. And pursue love for the Lord and for each other. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would protect us. I, I know we have some folks here this morning who are regular uh, attenders, members at other churches, and they're, they're here to show support for their loved one. And God, I, I pray first for the protection of Holiday Bible Church. I pray that you would keep us alert. I pray that you would grant us wisdom. I pray that you would keep us focused on you. And I pray that you would cause our love for one another to increase. And Lord, I would pray the same for those churches that are represented here today. God, protect them from the imposter. Lord, may our churches become a place where imposters are converted, where they cannot remain a wolf, but where the gospel is so clear, the gospel is so powerful that it transforms their very nature. Lord, save them from the fire by your own grace and mercy. a moment we'll finish up I'm going to give you an opportunity to once again to pray to maybe confess some things to the Lord yourself and then we'll pray and close let's pray together Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all of our unrighteousness. We pray that you have been honored by our time together. We pray that you will be honored yet. As we celebrate some baptisms, we welcome some into the fellowship of your people. And as we share a meal together, we ask these things in Jesus' name. I'm going to have you stand as we close with one final song, and then we're going to take that 10-minute transition period. And let me say this too. In the name of love, you know, if there is something you need to talk about, if there is some counsel you would like to get, um, please don't keep it to yourself. Come find someone who's willing to talk, willing to help you out, willing to point you to Christ and all that you got going on. Let's sing together. Let's sing the last. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed.
Let's take that intermission, and we will see you for the baptismal. You are dismissed.